Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to episode 134 of Making It with me, your host, Terry Wallman. I really appreciate you joining us every week, and I say that every week because it's the truth. I'd like to thank Blue Microphones and Mark of the Unicorn for their technical support and continuing to bring our show to you during this world health pandemic. And I want to remind you to please stay mindful and safe as we all work together as a global community. You can find all of our episodes on entertalkmedia.com, Apple Podcast, Spotify, or just go to terrywallman.com slash podcast. I hope you find my recent conversations with guests Gino Vanelli, Tony Basil, Peter Erskine, and so many other wonderful artists, both comforting, inspiring, and hopefully entertaining. I created this show to focus on what it takes to maintain a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music and entertainment business. My guest today is drummer, songwriter, producer, author, Joe Vitale. Born into a musical family, Joe Vitale is a veteran musician and drummer whose touring, recording, songwriting, and producing career has spanned over 40 years. Joe has recorded and toured with Ted Nugent, Joe Walsh, Dan Fogelberg, Peter Frampton, The Eagles, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and CSNY, to name a few. In addition, he has recorded with Ringo Starr, John Lennon, Keith Richards, Bill Wyman, Ronnie Wood, Van Morrison, Carl Wilson, Don Felder, Rick Derringer, Boss Gags, and many others. His songwriting credits include the classic Joe Walsh song, Rocky Mountain Way, and Pretty Maids All in a Row from the Eagles' classic album, Hotel California, both co-written with Joe Walsh. Vitaly continues to tour, record, write, and produce, and has no plans for slowing down. Joe Vitaly, welcome to Making It. Good day. How are you? Uh, all things considered, I'm actually doing really well. Thank you. How are you guys holding up? We're holding up. You know, um, uh, this thing is uh, is so, uh, uh, it's just strange. It's scary. It's eerie. And, uh, you know, we I, I try not to be glued to the TV because it's quite depressing. But, um, but you also got to see, you know, you got to get updates and see where we're at with this. It seems to be. I don't know. It seems to be okay. Um, uh, they're still, you know, I, I, what bothers me is they haven't reached a peak yet. And I think once we reach that peak, we're on the downside. I think everybody will feel a lot better. I agree. And, you know, we're limiting our television also. I, th I do think it's important to not obsess, but to stay informed. For me, you know, the best sources of information right now have been the World Health Organization and, you know, the doctors, the, the leaders in the medical field that are speaking, not the politicians. Yeah, that's who I want to hear from, because they're the guys that the politicians talk to as well. So uh, I just would like to hear it straight out of the horse's mouth, as they say. And, um, they, they've been really quite amazing and tirelessly working on this. And um, uh, God bless them. And they, they are, you know, in on the front lines, too. They're just uh, they're trying to figure this out, too, you know. Well, they are. And they're also putting their life at risk because the, the people that are speaking are, are also going to the hospitals and, and still working. I know. I know. And man, we need the hospital workers. If they go down, we're really screwed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they are starting to go down a lot more getting yeah. infected right now. Yeah. It's not good. So, yeah. you know, we're just watching it like everybody else. Uh, we're staying inside. We're washing our hands. We're doing, you know, we're obeying all the rules. And uh, so far, so good. And uh, we're just uh, hoping and praying that this thing gets over with. Uh, in our lifetime, we've never seen anything like this. 
No, there's there is no template for this. There's there is no experience that we've had, and we have had a lot of experiences. Uh, yeah, in, in our life, we're not we're not youngsters, and we've traveled the world. You ha- certainly have, but this is unlike anything that we could possibly. No, for. I know. I mean, we will always, for the rest of our life, we will remember the year twenty twenty. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's for sure. You know, Joe, you've had quite an eventful past couple of weeks from experiencing the tornado in Nashville. Well, you were there just recently recording to returning home to this worldwide health epidemic and yeah never a dull me <laughs> <laughs> is that like a sort of typical of your life or has this been exceptionally it, it, it's it you know it's 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 a wave you know it's yeah. it's waves it, it, it's a it's a it comes and goes you know and sometimes there's a you know a three months of nothing but dull living <laughs> and then all of a sudden you get three months of craziness. And I guess we're in that part right now. What do you normally do during the down periods of touring and, and recording? How do you use your time generally? Well, um, I, I, I don't have a lot that I do as far as many, many things. I do a few things and I really do them, uh, you know, religiously and, and just uh, one of which is I practice. And, uh, I, you know, I play my piano and my drums and, um, and I write and, and lately what I've been doing is since I, we've had, we've all had this unexpected vacation, uh, what, what I am doing is I'm going through a lot of old material that is partially written or not quite done or the beginnings of stuff. And I'm trying to develop it. It really keeps my, you know, I'll tell you what the, 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 the secret to, to writing and 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 focusing on your art and your work is no distractions <laughs> and uh we've been you know that's been uh out of our control now we have no distractions because there's nothing to do <laughs> so so you know it's actually a, it's a double-edged sword you know and i i really have been using it hopefully positively uh because you know, if there's no distractions and also we're trying to keep inside and not going out unless it's for, you know, really important needs like food and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, being forced to stay inside, uh, you, you have two choices. You can lay on the couch and watch TV or you can get something done. And, and a lot of times, you know, we all complain that, oh, I don't have enough time to finish this song. I wish I had more time. And uh, well, guess what? We got time. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly do. And one of my friends, another musician, he's a really gifted piano player and teacher as well, but he's also a minister. He was basically saying our job as musicians, he wanted to remind everybody, is to stir up joy. And I think yeah. it's, and I agree, and I think it's a really important time to continue to be creative. Yeah. And you know what? You, you know how many. We've all kind of tried to do that. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people stepping up to all the live uh, streaming last week. And, and um, a lot, you know, Facebook now has like every po- every other post is somebody playing their guitar or singing or playing a piano or something and because they're trying to continue their art and, and give a little to people. And I'll tell you what, it's relieving to go on Facebook or anywhere on the, on the internet and, and get a little, uh, you know, music, a little song and, and get your mind off of it. And it also keeps us from going stir crazy. You know, <laughs> it does. I've, I've actually been really entertained and inspired by some of the posts that people are making with their performances. And, you know, for instance, like I just saw Jonathan Brooke, who's a wonderful singer songwriter. I saw that too. I just saw that. Fantastic. Cause Jonathan has been just posting a song a day and then she just decided to do an hour. And it was, um, Melissa Manchester just did, uh, my buddy Keb Mode has been doing yep. songs from his living room and and yep. um i'm thinking it's time to do that as well you know from I th- our house i think you should uh you guys would be great and and i'll tell you what it's it's a real nice time to to do that and like i said you got two choices you can do that or you can do nothing and lay on the couch and then someday soon when we all back to work and busy you will re- you'll regret not you know putting your two cents in you know it's a good good time to 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 share and and try to help everybody feel better 
I'm glad you said that because it, it encourages me to stay on track because I'm putting out an acoustic guitar collection digitally, just releasing it. I'm completing that this week. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. And I had already started working on another solo album, but I'm I'm going to dig in and keep working on it. Yeah, that. Not, and don't get me wrong. it there's It's really fun to lay on the couch and watch movies yeah, and do we, nothing. It has been fun. There's been some fun things to, to see and catch yeah, up on. Yeah, I've kept caught up on some movies I haven't seen in a while and mm-hmm. all that. But you know, that, that like anything gets old. We, you know, we have a real hunger for what we do. And, and eventually you get hungry. And, you know, the couch thing and the movies or what are you going to do? There's nothing out. We don't, we can't go anywhere, really. We right. can get in the car and drive but the, to, to look at things, but you can't get out of the car and go in anywhere. So it's, it's just a, it's a weird time, but you know, it's, it, it uh, the last thing we want is stress in our life. We already got enough of that. And, and what happens is when you, when you play music or, uh, you, you know, whatever you're doing other than being glued to the news, you know, it takes a, a lot of that stress away. And I'll tell you what, it's really healthy emotionally and, and, and physically and, and it's just and mentally healthy to, to do that. So I really appreciate. Uh, you know, like what you're going to do and all the artists out there that are, that are playing live uh, on online and um, really cool. I saw Elton and all the big timers too. They're right. doing it too. Well, and even your son, Joe Jr. just released a new song that he wrote and performed. Yeah, it's really killer. It's called We're All In This Together. And it just, I, I knew he was messing around with the song because he was sending me mixes and saying, you know, dad, check out this mix. And, <laughs> and he, he didn't have the vocals done yet. So I was just listening instrumentally. And I was like, hey, this is pretty rocking. It's pretty killer. And all of a sudden, uh, he sends me the song. I was blown away how good it is. And then he did the video as well. Yeah. He's a badass musician. And I really think it's fantastic that he has learned how to edit video and, and not just be a musician, oh, man. but broadened himself. He does it all. And, uh, you know, I, I'm thankful because he taught, I don't do any video work and all that, that that's a whole nother animal, but, but, uh, he taught me all the digital recording stuff and this and that and the other. And I'm able to, uh, I'm able to record and, and, you know, and do all the stuff that, uh, all them guy, young guys are doing, you know, so, <laughs> right, right. The kids, Hey, the kids, <laughs> by the way, you know, one of the things that you offer and I, I'm not sure if you're still set up to do this at home, but I know that you've got an online drum tracking page on your website, yes. uh, jo- yes. jovitaliondrums.com. And are you open for business? Can you record tracks for people right now? Absolutely. That's the one thing we can do. We've got a studio down the road here that's just killer state of the art it's a privately owned studio and it's not like a commercial public studio this this guy is just he he it's his hobby but man did he build a place so and, and we're good friends and, and and he's got every state of the art piece of gear in there and so yes absolutely we're able to do tracks and it's safe and, for you um, to go there right now oh yes okay. absolutely no i got a key i go, i get to go in there right you can just go you in know. on your own and bring your your hand sanitizer and and <laughs> oh yeah plenty of plenty of drums and purell <laughs> <laughs> well that's the new normal as part of your drum yeah kit. but no no we're we're set up that that okay. hasn't stopped we're good we're good to go on that so if anybody's interested they can just reach out to you through your website the, it, it, there's a uh, you just link on the uh, through the website and there's a whole set of directions of how to go about it and it's real actually sim- uh, simple to navigate yeah well i encourage people to collaborate right now with anybody and everybody around the world i you know i got a message from somebody from fiji last night uh i've heard from people i heard from producers that i made a record with 30 years ago, they were calling, they text me, you okay, man, everything. I got, it's so wonderful to hear from these people. And you know what? This, this is a kind of a life lesson we're learning here that, you know what? Uh, sometimes we need to s- just stop and, and think about other people and their needs and older people and, 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 um, and who we can help. And it's just a wonderful feeling. And, you know, I, I hate that we were faced with this pandemic to realize that. But sometimes you get, you know, you get kicked in the ass and, and, and by something. And all of a sudden you kind of wake up and go, hmm, what, what's really important to you, you know? And um, 
Uh, and, and life will get back to normal, and we'll be going out playing and doing gigs and, and, and you know doing all that. But while we have this opportunity, it's really good for the heart and soul to, to help people and check on people. I checked on my neighbor, and I asked, called him yesterday. He's 80 years old. Mm-hmm. He's like, you need anything? I'm going to the store. And he was so, so thankful that I called, and I've never called him in my life. <laughs> yeah. And and it's like I called him, and, and it was great. And, uh, you know, my wife, Susie, she said, you know, you got to call them guys across the street. They're pretty old. So, yeah. you know, and, and that kind of, uh, I like that. I like it that people are really reaching out and helping each other. That's something we haven't seen in a while. And, and not it's just because we get all busy and busy, right. into our life. And I understand that. We're all, we're all busy, and we've got our own lives get all caught up in all that and uh, all of a sudden the, the, the things man things came to a, a halt yeah it it is so incredible you know you mentioned yeah. that that uh, your son joe junior really has taught you a lot about recording digitally and you know learning all the yep. new technology however i want people to know that technology and and studio design and building is not new to you you're a builder. Your whole life you have been making things and creating things and putting things together. And you have built studios, literally. Yeah, I built a bunch. And uh, uh, one of the ones I'm real proud of is I built uh, Stephen Stills' studio. And, uh, I mean, we started from scratch. We built the whole thing and wired it. And um, uh, I, I don't think he knows how to turn it on, but that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. You know, a lot of guys are like that. They own these beautiful studios and, and they have engineers to right. do all that, you know, yeah. but, um, I do. And, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to know how to do that sort of stuff because, you know, um, I'd feel a little bit, uh, uh, you know, weird if I, if I had equipment that I didn't know how to use, you know? And so one thing I had that I did not know how to use was a computer. When everything went from tape to digital, uh, that, that was a whole life changing experience, you know? And we made records with tape and, and, and an analog gear all our lives. And all of a sudden there's this whole new animal you got to deal with. And so, that's where my son, my son used to work with me. He would help record and then do editing and this, that, and the other. And then, and I got, I got really tired of bothering him all the time. And so he finally took me to school and, and just taught me how to do it all. And I'm able to, now I'm able to get around myself and, and I'm real comfortable with it. And I've gotten actually pretty good at it and uh, good enough for me, you know, and that, that I need. And, um, so yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to have built all them studios and, and, and I'm glad I know about that. I, I'm also glad that all of us guys our age that have been around the block here for a while in, in music, we, we learned how to record the old way. And I'll tell you what, mm-hmm. I'm so thankful for that because, uh, I get a lot of questions from uh, younger people that are musicians that, uh, about how to, how to use analog gear and what it was like to do it this way and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of them are really hip and they're very trending towards the old analog sound and they love vinyl records. And, uh, you know, that they, they got ears. They can tell what we did had, had a certain type of quality to it that they're trying to go after. And, you know, there's not enough apps in the world. Or I'm sorry, not apps. There's not enough plugins in the world uh, to replace tape and uh, you know they've done an amazing job at it but there's something about tape that was really wonderful and so they're all very interested in in all that and in how we made records and um, I'm glad to see that they got a, a healthy interest in that. I am too that's encouraging to hear and you know one of the things that we have been really fortunate with our age is we've been on a lot of recording sessions on the receiving end of really world-class engineers. So learning how to place microphones and microphone choices and drum tunings. And and you also, you've had equal opportunity to work on major records as well as tour with major artists for your most of your career or actually all of your career. So I would imagine that you've learned a lot about that, you know, drum tuning and mic placement and you know, live versus recording and how in some ways it's still the same concept, which is 
<laughs> as one engineer friend told me many years ago when we all started needing to learn how to self-record in our studios, as he said, it's not that complicated. He said, you take a really good musician, put them in front of a great instrument, put a good microphone up, and put it where it sounds great and hit record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, uh, one good thing about all that old school knowledge is – you know, that, that hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. uh, may, maybe where all this music terminates to a, 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 a hard drive is different than tape. Sure. But everything up to that hard drive has not changed. You still need a good sounding instrument, whether it be drums or an amplifier or a bass or what have you. And you need really good mics and mic frees and everything that leads from yourself to through the instrument to the to the gear it just the termination is different we used to it terminated to tape now it's to a hard drive so uh but everything we learned is 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 you still apply all that to what we're doing so uh i it was a nice trade-off with my son because he taught me everything about the digital world and i taught him about it. he grew up with me in studios and he knew a little bit about the analog world but i really took him to school on analog and so and, and he uses all that knowledge uh, in his digital world. So it's a nice marriage between it all. I agree. Um, you know, you were mentioning practicing. And um, one thing that people might not know about you is you are a multi-instrumentalist. In addition to playing drums and percussion, you do play piano. I believe you play flute. You sing. Correct, yeah. So how do you break up your practice time? Are you still picking up the flute every day for 20 minutes? Or... <laughs> I, do, I, do what's, I do what's easiest first. <laughs> <laughs> drums. And that's drums. Yeah. <laughs> and I uh, play the drums. Um, I play, I play, I don't really practice piano because I'm not trying to be a piano player. I've learned enough on piano to write. Yes. And, um, and I, and I got good enough to play, you know, but I, and record and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, my main instrument is drums. Flute is just an afterthought because I love the instrument and, and I, I just had an, you know, an yearning to learn it. And I, I'm, that's a work in progress, though. I'm still learning it. And I do practice it because that's a little bit different instrument to practice. You know, like drums is, you have to keep your, your physical self to get up, you know, and, and, and in shape. Mm -hmm. With flute, uh, you have to keep your, your, your mouth and amateur in, in shape, but that goes away after if you don't practice. And so I practice drums uh, every day. And uh, and I play my piano most every day because I'm writing or, or doing some stuff. And flute, uh, maybe once a week I'll pick it up. Mm -hmm. you know? But um, uh, it's really it's really good to to constantly play your instrument. You, you know what? Even a half hour a day is better than nothing. And um, uh, you'd be surprised how much that helps. And um, I encourage that. And especially, like I say, with this downtime we have. Man, take advantage of yeah. it because it's going to be back to work, people, <laughs> pretty soon. That's true. We're going to have to get back to the whatever day job or road job, whatever job you have. It's coming back. And, you know, and so uh, I'm taking advantage of it as best I can. And I get bored. You know, I just, it's not, you know, I, you know, when you play in front of live audiences, that's really fun. And you're, you're communicating with a people out there. You know, when you practice it, it's you're communicating to a wall, you know, in your room, and it and it's really uh, it takes a lot of discipline to do that. And uh, but you know, a lot of people do that. I mean, it's not like um, it's not like uh, I'm doing something you know out of the ordinary. It, it, that's what it's like. Whether you sit around with a guitar and just plucking and playing around, you know, and just having fun and learning stuff and trying new things. It's always good. I, I I like to think that every time I sit down with my instrument, I'd like to say that I, I learned one thing new. So uh, th that would be a good uh, – I would be satisfied if, if, I, if I did learn even one little thing every time I played, you know. I like that. You know, just something. You might find a, on guitar, you might find a new way to play this lick or a new – you know, whatever it is. Uh, it's it's healthy. It's really good for you. Let's go back to your early childhood because your family, your your dad, my dad was uh, Tony. Tony, 
So yeah. you were born in Canton, Ohio, but you and you started playing drums at a pretty early age. And your dad was a barber, and he would trade haircuts for drum lessons. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. It was, uh, you know, uh, we were broke, man. We we, we all were. But yeah, we were all broke, <laughs> and uh, I, I I was grew up broke. And so we we had a nice, warm, nice, friendly family, but we were broke. And so, uh, yeah, he was a barber. And and, and uh, this guy that was teaching me, the fantastic drummer teacher, and uh, he would, the reason we knew him is he went to get haircuts from my dad. So they talked one day and, and they made a deal where, you know, he traded a haircut for a drum lesson. So I, and I was, and I, we did that for two years. So uh, it was great. I learned a whole lot from him, and uh, he got a lot of free haircuts. You know, so, <laughs> well, I read that also that you guys formed a polka band with your dad called the Tony Vitali Trio, and your dad oh, was yeah. he, your dad played accordion. Yes, and your brother was playing bass. That's correct. And that led to you ending up playing with a band called the Echoes. Yeah, we played at a uh, one of those, uh, you know. Um, out in the country, a little little town that had a annual like a, a, a picnic. The whole town had a picnic in the summer, and so my dad's polka band was supposed to play on the little stage for one of the days. And after my dad's band played, there was a group, a rock, a rock and roll band called the Echoes, and uh, they were from our area here. And they came up to me and they said, "Listen." Uh, our drummer couldn't make it today. Can you imagine that, huh? Our drummer couldn't make it today. Could you fill in? Could you play drums with us? And I was like thrilled because I was like 14, 15 years old. And, and um, uh, you know, I'd seen the Beatles on, on Ed Sullivan. And I was like, I really wanted to play rock and roll. So um, I said, sure, I'll sit in. And uh, I did. And it was it was like that. so much fun. I can't even tell you. I, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. And um and what happened, long story short, was, you know, a couple months later, they had called me and I joined the band and that uh, that put me in the, in the rock and roll world. And uh, unfortunately, it was very hard to quit my dad's band. <laughs> he, he, uh, if, if you're Italian, you don't quit your dad's polka band. You know? <laughs> but I had to. I just had to. And uh, and that started the whole thing, you know, and uh so that little, little town, Magnolia, Ohio, uh, that was where it all started. And it, uh, like I said, I, I, and you know, what's really fun is that that was you know, what, 50 years ago, whatever it was. Yeah. And, um, so, uh, they still have that homecoming picnic every summer. And we went down one, one summer and that, that bandstand and stage is still there. It's identical. They have it. All they've done through all the years is, keep it painted <laughs> and so uh it's still there and to see that and look at that it was like wow I, you know so long ago but that's where it all started so this this band the echoes ended up getting signed with warner was it warner brothers and and became right. b- became the childs right we became the childs we changed our name and we signed a contract with warner brothers records and we were so young uh, 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 Terry, that our, our dads and had to sign for us the contract. Mm-hmm. We were too young; it wasn't legal for us to sign it. So our dads and just recently, I, I received a copy of that contract, and uh, it was oh, so weird know. to read it. And uh, and uh, so uh, we signed a, a, a major label deal uh, in, when we were still in high school, and um, we had a, a two three singles out, and uh, we made the Billboard charts and everything. So since you said earlier that you remember this like it was yesterday, some of these experiences, I think your very first recording session that's documented is with the Childs in 1965, Correct. I believe. And can you tell me what you remember about your that session? I imagine you've got memories of it. I do. Uh, that that was, uh, I thought, you know, this is the big time. You know, it was actually just a little studio in Akron, Ohio. <laughs> And I just thought, you know, was you know, as primitive as it was, we had never seen equipment like this, you know, yeah. and tape that was that thick, and and you know, and it was just, uh, it was pretty amazing, and um, 
And uh, it was actually the first time we recorded, professionally recorded, and uh, we were blown away how, how good we sounded. And, and, and when I listened back to some of that, it, we weren't that good, <laughs> but <laughs> it wasn't that good. But we were we were impressed with ourselves. But um, uh, because up to that point, we had recorded, but at home, you know, at our home with our little microphone and a little stupid tape recorder. But uh, so we had finally gotten a chance to record professionally. And, and that's one thing I remember about that session was that um we had never heard ourselves recorded professionally you know to sound like that and uh it was uh it was pretty exciting it was really exciting it was so innocently exciting and um uh we were just uh we were kids you know we were on top of the world and um you know, uh, you know, the sky's the limit after that, you know, and we, we had all our dreams. We had all these dreams after that, and, you know, to, to do this. And, um, it was a, a wonderful time, you know, Th- thanks for sharing that. Cause it's, I can vividly and vicariously go, you know, just experience that with you because I re- I remember my first recording experiences also. And they're, they're just, it was kind of mind boggling and, it and, was. and I- exciting. It, remember the equipment it seemed so important and, and uh, we were like kind of scared kind of freaked out in sure. a way we were a little ner- very nervous more than scared but um uh because it was like hey this is for real guys and uh no fooling around in here but you know what the guys the guys came through we sounded good it was good it was uh we had fun and we made our little 45s and and uh uh, you know, it was just a great time uh, to be in music. Uh, it's it's quite a bit different now. And, and back then it was, you know, it's so hard. It's very difficult now for young bands. They, they're, they're, they're getting out there and they're doing it. But boy, it's, it's, just, it's a lot more of a struggle than what we, we had to go through. I, I agree. You know, this, the stories that my friends have told me that came up, you know, playing with, you know, major bands like yourself, uh, you know, the, the stories were always more, um, organic, you know, they were just at this club and they sat in with this person. The next thing, you know, you're in James Taylor's band, you know, right, or, right, right, right. or Crosby, Stills, Nash, or, uh, for example, I mean, CSN, you played on their big record, you know, the CSN record, Crosby, Stills, Nash, Wooden Ships and all those iconic songs. But, you know, I would imagine that just led because somebody, you knew somebody who knew somebody who liked the way you sounded or liked hanging out with you. Yeah, that's just the, the you know, today we have social networking and online networking and all that. We didn't have anything like that. What we had back then, the only networking we had was you had to be in the right place at the right time. Right. And, and that was the networking because there was not nothing like today. I mean, I wish we had that, but we didn't. And what happened back then was there was millions of clubs, rock and roll clubs, and everybody in a band would play all these clubs and everybody would go listen to other people's bands. And it, it was a really healthy time in music. And so what would happen is, you know, you'd be playing your heart out in some club with like 10 people in the audience and, 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 and somebody walks in and you don't know that even that they're there, but thank God you were pouring it out and, and getting down and playing real hard. And all of a sudden they talk to you and all of a sudden you got a better gig, you know, right. or some or a big gig or what have you. And then when you're on that gig, you know, you're on the road playing bigger places and somebody's on the side of the stage from another band and they see, and they like you, you know, it's it that's the kind of network we had it was it was it was not at all anything like today's networking and um uh it was a little bit more challenging because you had to prove yourself in, in live and in person you know you know in real time you had to prove yourself you couldn't put up stuff on youtube or stuff that you know that that has been fine tuned and mastered and all that it was raw. You were at a club playing and and you either got the, a gig or not, you know? And so I, I really, uh, that's a little rougher on uh, networking, but I'll tell you what, it sure did work. And, um, I, a lot of my friends, a lot of guys I know that got gigs like that. They started, we all started in clubs, you know, schlepping our own gear down and up, up and down stairs and, you know, playing for 10 people for three hours. And, but you know what? If you keep at it, it'll pay off. It will. Uh, it, it, sometimes it's quick. Sometimes it's not, but it will pay off. And, um, 
uh, that's the only advice I have is don't give up. That's the worst thing you can do. And um, uh, just keep at it. You know, uh, we were on the road opening for Kiss when they first started. And, and you know, they, they we were playing some dumb, just this horrible place. And there was like 50 people there. And it's like Kiss comes out of their van or whatever they had. And they're in full makeup with the whole outfits and, the, you know, ki- all kiss make, you know, right. and, and we're like, looking at them like, what a bunch of idiots, <laughs> you know, what are you, what are you doing? There's 50 people in there, but you know what? Uh, we were wrong. They went in there and put on a killer show and we looked at them and it was very impressive. And it was, you know, it was like inspiring to see the, that, okay, these guys need business. They don't care if there's 50 or 50,000 people in there. They're going to put on their show and they're going to give it all they got. And that was really inspiring to us as young players on the road, you know. And um, as a matter of fact, I ran into Paul Stanley not too long ago. <laughs> we talked We talked about that and uh, and we were laughing about it. And, and uh, but, you know, both ba- we were none of us. We were nobodies, the bands, you know, and we opened shows for Aerosmith in the in the seventies, and Steven Tyler had his scarves, and the microphone was all decorated, yeah. and you know, and and we're looking at him like, who who do you think you are? And and because we were like, <laughs> we we were the ones that needed to you know get with it, and and all of a sudden we looked, we were inspired by so many bands, and all of a sudden we 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 understood, and and we we really took because. You know, my father told me that years ago before I ever got into rock and roll. He said, you know, if there's one people, one person in the audience or 10, you, you put on the same, you know, show. And, 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 and he was correct. And, um, uh, that stuck with me my whole life. And so, you know, you can't always play stadiums or you can't always play, you don't have to always play dives or little bars, but no matter what you play from bars to stadiums, you know, you got to give it your all. That's a powerful piece of advice from your dad, and I couldn't agree more. Yeah, way back, I I said okay. <laughs> I didn't know what he was talking. <laughs> okay, Dad, sure, okay, great. Right. Didn't really quite <laughs> understand it, but but it made it sounded true and important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounded right, you know. But uh, no, nah, he was right uh, about that, and, and I've lived, lived like that ever since. And my whole life, I've treated the stage like that. How did it come about that you ended up? working with Ted Nugent and joining the Amboy Dukes in 1971. Did, did Ted hear you play in a club? Yep. He came into JB's, a club in Kent, Ohio, where Kent State University was. Uh, I was playing one club, and, and actually Joe Walsh was there too. He was playing another club. But I was playing this one club called JB's, and Ted Nugent showed up. Uh, we didn't even know he was there, even though he, he would be quite hard to miss. <laughs> <laughs> True. He'd be very hard to miss. He had his fringe jacket on with his huge, you know, you know, all these, his big boots and a long hair and beard. Anyway, we didn't know he was there. And, uh, so I was playing, trying to, you know, just do my thing and playing rock and roll in a band. And, uh, uh, you know, a week later I, I, he, I heard from him. I don't know how he found me, but he found me and, um, uh, you know, he called me and he said, Hey, I, I heard you play. I go, when did you hear me play? You know? <laughs> and he told me, and, and he said, listen, would you want to come up to, uh, Michigan? He was living outside of Ann Arbor at the time. And, uh, he said, you want to come up to Michigan and, uh, play with my band? I went, heck yeah. <laughs> Anything to get out of this dive, this club. <laughs> so, um, and that's kind of what happened. And, and we, we got along real well. And, um, uh, we we were on the road for about six months, and um, then we we opened a show for the James Gang, and uh, my good friend Joe Walsh was you know we knew each other way back in Kent. Right, you, know? you you and and Joe Walsh met at Kent State University where where you were attending school, both of you. Correct, and so so uh, we opened for the James Gang, and Joe told me after the show, he said, "Hey, listen, uh, stop by my my hotel. I want to talk to you." I said, okay, we were friends anyway. We knew each other. And so he said, um, uh, Hey, uh, I, I'm wanting to do something different than the James Gang. You want to put a band together? And I said, heck yeah. Cause I, we always talked about putting a band together, but we, you know, I, you know, they had the James Gang. They were very successful mm-hmm. and they were doing well, but he wanted to do something a little different. So he, 
he talked to me about it and I said, yeah. And I talked to Ted about it. Ted was very cool about it. He said, man, that's great. You guys should be in a band. And, hmm. and Ted was very cool about it. And um, so that started the whole relationship with, uh, with Joe. Kent State was a great experience for you for multiple reasons. Besides getting a fantastic education, you also met your lifelong friend, Joe Walsh, and you met Susie, your wife. Yeah, my wife. I met in 1969. We met and uh, we got married in 73. And uh, this year makes 47 years marriage. Congratulations. And is that kind of, does, is that, I mean, looking back, does that feel like just a blink of an eye or? It does. I I can't believe it. (laughs) When you look at, I mean, 47 years, I mean, uh, that's a long time to, and, but I'm I'm so glad and so proud and, um, of it. And, uh, I think I only know one person, one of my friends have been married a little bit longer than me uh, at our age and all that, Mm -hmm. but, um, but uh, no, I uh, Kent was very important to me um, uh, for th- both those exact reasons. Obviously, for for my uh, my marriage and 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 with Joe. Then, uh, unfortunately, uh, the 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 dark side of that experience was the you know the Kent shootings. We were there when it was horrible. May fourth, nineteen seventy. Yeah, and you know I got to tell you this May. Uh, it was going to be the May 2nd. It, it was on the 4th, but this May 2nd, this year, we were, me and Joe Walsh were going to play. We were going to play a, 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 a memorial concert at Kent, and it got canceled because of this virus. Yeah. And that was going to be, we sold that thing out in a half hour. I would imagine. And, yeah. And it was because everybody, want, you know, we were so much connected with that city, and we were both there when it happened. And we we worked together all these years. It was it was a natural that we we were going to be there. And David Crosby was going to play, and, uh, and a couple other acts. But um, uh, it's so what a bummer to, to, that it canceled. We were hoping that because when we first heard about this virus, that okay, that's that's a drag that we're shutting down this and that and the other. But we'll be good by May second. Hmm. Well, I guess not. <laughs> so. Uh, they can't. Yeah, they 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 canceled that. They canceled everything. It seems like. Yeah. Well, I I hope that you get to reschedule that once it's safe for everybody to gather again. And and I think we will because I'm hoping we will yeah. because it's too uh it's too much of a day. It's 50 years and it's too big, much of a memorial to to just pass over. So maybe and as long as it's. Everybody understands what's going on with the but we it, it's 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 understood that of course it canceled. So if if we could at least uh, revisit it sometime this year, uh, and, and worst case scenario, even if it was in twenty twenty one, that that's fine. Just just so for the for the four kids that lost their lives, just so we can we were going to help out, but that was going to be a, a scholarship fund for uh, some other kids, and and then you know it just. The whole thing should should really take still take place at some point. I agree, and and I just want to speak about that for a moment. Two things: one is just a little bit of history for people. The commission issued its findings in a September 1970 report that concluded that the Ohio National Guard shootings on May 4th, 1970, were unjustified. And the report said that even if the guardsmen faced danger, it was not a danger that called for lethal force. The 61 shots by 28 guardsmen certainly cannot be justified. And there's, I read a quote of yours, or you might have told me in a, in a previous conversation, <clears throat> but the quote is, it seems like we've come so far yet are still standing in the same place. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's been so long and I'm wondering if we've learned our lesson. I, I don't know. It, that was so tragic. And, um, you know, those guardsmen, some of them were the same age as those students. Right. That's what I remember from watching the news. And, and man, I was like, oh, I, I don't remember uh, who, I don't know if anybody ever even found out who gave the order why did the guardsmen have a, a live ammo? Uh, you know, they, you know, if it, it got out of hand that much, they could have used yeah, something, not, but not live ammo. Right. And uh, it seems that I read that the troublemakers during that whole uh, 
debacle was was the kids from uh, a bunch of kids came down from Detroit. They were members of the SDS, which is Students for a Democratic Society. They were kind of like troublemakers. And the students at Kent State, they were very uh, peaceful demonstration people. They 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 didn't want to have any trouble. They they felt you know of course they had the right to demonstrate, of course, and they were always peaceful. But for some reason, these other people came down and started riling it up and getting getting crazy. And then, you know, our, I guess some of our kids joined in. I don't know what it was, but I mean, the whole thing was just a big mess, you know, and, and tragically ended up in four dead students, you know. Yeah. Well, if you do get to um, put that concert up sometime, maybe later this year or next year, you will certainly be letting people know about it on your website. And it- Absolutely. Oh, yeah. It'll be big news anyway. Uh, it was going to be big news. And uh, so I, I have hopes that we're going to still do it. I do, too. You've got three solo albums out. And the first one you recorded, Roller Coaster Weekend in 1974. Right. You also have Plantation Harbor. In right, 1981, speaking in drums right. in 2008. Correct, yeah. What inspired you or who encouraged you to make your first solo record and move from being a, a sideman to an artist? Uh, well, uh, I had written a lot of songs uh, for the Joe Walsh stuff we did. Mm-hmm. And, and not, you know, and not all of them were used, of course, but I wrote a lot of songs. And I all of a sudden I ended up with... Um, with a lot of songs and, uh, they were, I thought they were pretty good. And, um, so, uh, when, when the, the, the Joe Walsh band started to kind of break up, we, we didn't really break up. Like, I hate you. I never want to play with you again. <laughs> it wasn't like that. It was, you know, we were all, you know, we had all, we run its course. It, it, we had a good run and all of a sudden other people were doing other things. And so, uh, that happens all the time in music. And so, I uh, here I am with all these extra songs, and you know back then uh, it, it was so. Uh, I mean, it, it's so hard for young people today. Back then, I flew to New York City with a cassette hmm. with four really horrible sounding demos. <laughs> the, the the songs were good, you know, but you know I didn't have any recording gear and all. And it was on a cassette. I, I flew to New York. I had an appointment with Mark Byerson from a- Atlantic Records. And I sat in his office. That's the way we used to do it back then. And I sat in the office and we played it, the, the, the four songs. And, and he listened to them. And he goes, hey, let me bring a couple of the guys in here and listen. And all of a sudden, you know, this, that, the other took place. And all of a sudden, I got a record deal with Atlantic Records. And um, and so I made the first album. Now, it, you know, it wasn't based on the quality. It wasn't based on, you know, how many likes I have on Facebook. It was, it, you know, it's so crazy now. And it wasn't based on, uh, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. It was based on one thing, the music. Right. And, and so they felt that there was enough there in the songs that they felt they would invest in making an album with me. And so we did. And, um, you know, I, I, I wish it was it, that wasn't easy because, you know, it took me a long, long time to put those songs together and all that. And, and I wasn't really expecting a deal, but all of a sudden I got it. But it, what was easy was I was able to call, make an appointment and go in and good luck trying to do that today. It's very difficult, you know, to to, you know, you you have to make the call then they got to look at your your um, well first you need to find the phone number which nobody will want to give you that's the the, there you go you it was in the phone book terry (laughs) (laughs) atlantic records you call atlantic records hi i'd like to talk to somebody i have music i want to like we're we're stupid you know we're like we didn't know what we're doing yeah and so (laughs) and and it's it's sad that it's that difficult because there's a lot of great talent these young people and there's a killer artists out there and who's you know you got to hear them and so yeah it's hard to communicate that and then once you even get through uh then they want to know all this stuff about you know how many oh, how many followers you have on facebook and uh, your twitter and it's like what how about the music you know mm-hmm. <laughs> and so yeah it's a little different world now but i mean there's still people that are uh, managing to get you know getting deals and they're doing well and all that but it's just a little bit rougher road to get 
from point A to point B, you know. And so uh, so that's how that happened with Roller Coaster Weekend. I know that Bill Simzik produced your second album, Plantation Harbor. Right. Did you produce your first record yourself? No. That was uh, Ron and Howie Albert. Okay. Uh, and they uh, they produced, they worked with Eric Clapton, they worked with Stephen Stills and Crosby Stills Nash. They did a lot of records down there. It was at Criteria in Florida, Miami, oh, Florida. Right. And, that, and that's where I grew up, it was in Miami, and Criteria yeah. was. Um, it, 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 oh, that was happening oh, in it was the incredible. 70s. Every, Absolutely. Once the, Bee Gees, once the Bee Gees uh, made the. Uh, uh, Stay alive, Staying alive yeah. al album there uh it, it, it's just exploded they, they had so much business there everybody and, um, came down there it was incredible to be in that right. neighborhood that's where bill worked on the eagle stuff and um and uh, we actually recorded uh we recorded rocky mountain way in studio c at criteria you did mm. yeah amazing amazing yeah. so when you were a kid you lived in florida for a short time where was that in Fort Lauderdale. In Fort Lauderdale. So yeah. when you went back to Miami again, you, it was familiar to you then. You had some memories of of what it was like, I would imagine. But we're, you know, one of the things I remember back in the day when all the, the rock stars were coming down to record w was they would also go down to Coconut Grove and play soccer on Sundays at the park by the water. And were, were you getting yep. out and doing all the fun things in Miami as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> were you just we were, taking drugs and, and staying in the studio? <laughs> we were in the studio for like 12, 15 hours. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and you know, uh, it was crazy. Uh, Stephen would keep us in there, uh, Stephen Stills. We, he, he, we'd go, we got to go home. We're going to bed, Stephen. And he'd be up, he'd stay, we'd say, he'd say, I'll see you in the morning. Yeah. And he'd be working all night and all that. And that's a, remember, we were also in our 20s and early 30s. Right. So, so we had the energy we to had get the by energy. three or four hours of sleep a night. Yes. And so we, uh, we, we, we spent a lot of hours there. And, uh, you know, actually, when we'd take a weekend off now and then, uh, all we would do is we'd go to the ocean or something, just yeah. kind of just chill. Rest. And <laughs> yeah, just rest and chill and get our heads cleared. So on Monday morning, we did it again. But. It was a great environment in the 70s down there because a lot of big records were being made down there. Yeah, that's for sure. Can you talk about your book, Backstage Pass, which, by the way, I've read, and it's such a cool book. Well, thank you. Um, that was a long time coming. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my wife, Susie, wrote the book and did a brilliant job. I could have never done what she did, and all I did was talk to her uh, and she recorded the stories and all that. But the the way it came about was, you know, when you're on the road, you've been there, you're on a bus and after shows and you don't always go to bed right away mm -hmm. and you hang out and, and, you know, just hang out, have some eat and just sit around and, and, and talk and whatever. And you laugh about a lot of stuff <laughs> where people have, everybody's got band stories, right? right? Everybody's got, you know, and what's it so-and-so, you know, and, and so, for some reason, I, I, I kind of think it's not that I'm such a comedian, but for some reason, the, the people I worked with, you know, were, were funny people. They did funny stuff, you know, and so <laughs> uh, and crazy stuff at times. And so I seem to have the stories that that generated a lot of, you know, laughter and, and interest and all that. So uh, for a couple of years on tours and stuff, you know, uh, when in the in the in the 90s seemed like a lot of rock and roll books were coming out, you know, and so and then in the, after 2000, there were more rock and roll books, you know, and so these guys on the bus were saying, man, these are good stories. You should write a book. And I went, I don't want to write a book, man. I, I, I don't, you know, they said, no, no, these are great stories. You got to write a book. And I said, oh, OK, I'll write a book. And so I wasn't going to write a book, but I said that. And um, so I go home and I told my wife that. And she, I said, these guys are bugging me about writing a book. She goes, I, we should write a book. You, you got these great stuff. I said, OK, I give up. I'm going to write a book. So I didn't write the book. She wrote the book, but I had the stories. And um, uh, I'm so glad I did because I'm just glad it got all documented. We've got 700 and over 750 photos in the book. and. Um, uh, it, and so, you know, and that's where those photos really generated a lot of memory as far as, you know, I, I remember a lot, all that stuff, but the timetable is hard to remember 
when was that tour that we did so and so and so and so did it and we had to go bail out so and so for the jail and you know that kind when what year was that so you know it's photos that really really can can put a timeline on your life you know and so uh we went through literally 10,000 photos to because I took photos all my life on the road and so we went through all these photos and we put together what we did and um uh, uh, out of all the, the, the people that have, have it and read it and all that, we've never gotten a single bad review. So we are happy about that. It's a no dirt book. It's a fun book. It's funny as hell. It really and is. Yeah. I laughed while I was reading it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I laugh sometimes when I'm refreshing on a story I'm going to do an interview about or something. I, I laugh to myself even again. And I, I was there. And so, uh, it's, it's very funny. And, um, uh, and, and I, I don't really care for the books with a lot of dirt and all that. You can get that on, on the news, you know, uh, and I, I really, well, that's not your my, style either. Well, they're, they're, they're my, they're my friends, right? They're my friends. And, and, uh, and, you know, everybody's got stuff they don't want in, in the public, you know, who doesn't, but these are my friends. I'm not going to talk about all that stuff. I remember when I played with the Eagles, I got phone calls after phone calls from these writers that, Hey, I want to know about that. I'm not going to tell you anything about the, you know, stuff like they were looking for dirt and, uh, I don't do that and I never will. And, uh, and my friends know that about me. And so, um, but that's what was fun about the book though. It was like, you know, and the nicest thing too about the book is you or I could read it and, and our sons or daughters could read it. it. There's no, there's no weirdness in the book that you wouldn't want your kid to read it even, you know? So now we're real happy with it. People can find the book on your website. Is that the best way if, if they're interested in getting it? That's, that's the best way to do it. And we will actually, we'll sign it too. There'll be an autograph. Book. Oh, wonderful. By the way, the, the website again is com, and there's a funny story as to why your website is not Joe Vitale, because some other guy took your website name. Right. Uh, I was, I was, I really wanted it to be my name with dot .com, right? but, but my son, Joe Jr., my son, <laughs> he took it, com. so yeah, he took it, but that's okay, because... <laughs> You know, he, he, uh, that's all right. I don't mind that. <laughs> Let's talk about songwriting for a moment and the, and the art of collaboration. And I'd love to have you describe the art of collaboration from your perspective, but I want to ask you about two lyrics first of songs that you've written, co-written with Joe Walsh. Okay. One of them, Pretty Maids. The, the, right. the lyric starts, hi there, how are you? It's been a long time. Seems like we've come a long way. Right. How did that song start? And was there a particular, is there a backstory? Uh, it's somewhat of a story. Um, that's what Joe sat at the piano and played. Okay. And that's all he had at the time. And I was listening. I was like, wow, okay. this, this can go to a lot of nice places. Yeah, it's a great start. Yeah. And then the next time we sat down, uh, he had a little bit of more of the lyric ideas and but he didn't have what the one thing that was missing, and that was the chorus. Yeah. And that's what I wrote, and uh, that kind of like put it together. I remember that that uh, uh, Glenn Fry was listening to the song, and he said, "I, I like this." He said, "You guys got to finish this song." So I would like to think that I helped finish it because uh, you know uh, that's the one thing he was missing. And, ha- and knowing about, you know, Eagles vocals, boy, they just nailed that chorus with their vocals. It's just beautiful. Oh, it's exquisite. It's such a beautiful yeah, they, song they, and performance. Yeah, they were they were the right singers for that chorus. And so that's why I kind of geared it towards that when I was writing that chorus. Um, I could hear their voices doing, you know, and, and what they would do with it and, and that and more. And so... Um, that really was a, a really a, a beautiful experience to write that. 
and it must have been incredible to really hear it come to life the oh, way you imagined oh, man. it or beyond the, what you imagined. Incredible, absolutely. And what was really amazing is in, in uh, the Hell Freezes Over time mm-hmm. when they did it with the live orchestra, just stunning and just beautiful. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. What about Rocky Mountain Way? Uh, and lyrically, you start off, spent the last year Rocky Mountain Way, couldn't get much higher, out to pasture, think it's safe to say, time to open fire. Right. What does that mean? Uh, well, the, the whole lyric is where they say, uh, uh, Casey's at bad time to change the batter. Uh, yeah. That whole song was was directed towards Joe's manager. And it was time to change the batter. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what that song was about. He had just moved to Colorado. I moved there too and joined him. And we, you know, we made the first Barnstorm album. Then, then the second album is where Rocky Mountain Way appeared. And um, uh, I, I wrote more of the music. He, he wrote the lyrics. Mm-hmm. And so, so, uh, and I remember that we needed one more song for the album. And Joe had just, started to really master slide guitar hmm. and uh and he he got real good at it real quick where did he learn it's, who were his influences as a slide player? oh i can tell you the whole story okay. Dwayne allman uh, when Dwayne allman passed away i believe he passed away in 71 i think somewhere around then 71 72 Dwayne allman passed away i can't remember but uh when uh, joe loved Dwayne allman and when he died uh, uh joe said well I'm going to take up the reins for Dwayne. And he, he picked up the guitar, started playing slide. He was pretty bad at first because that's a whole nother animal. You know? it, that's oh, it different. is. Absolutely. And it's totally different. You got your intonation and your, your, you know, your vibrato can't be too fast. Mm-hmm. You know? There's all kinds of stuff. And he, at first he wasn't, he wasn't really good. <laughs> so he became one of the world's best slide player. But I mean, yeah. so he worked really hard at it, and eventually uh, he got real good with it. And uh, Bill Simsick, our producer, said, "Man, you gotta, you gotta do a song on this album that features your new talent mm-hmm. on the slide guitar." And so, uh, what better to to you know to use a, a, a slide guitar than a slow blues in E? You know, <laughs> and so. So we wrote the uh, Rocky Mountain Way, uh, for, you know, based on his slide playing and all that. And it wasn't really a throwaway, but it was a, a, a final song that we put together. And um, uh, here it turns out to be his, you know, his flagship song, you know. But um, it, it came out so good. And uh, and his slide playing is just ridiculous on it. And, oh, it's phenomenal. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that that's where that came from. But the, the lyrically, that was... Um, he was in Colorado and, and looking at the mountains and, and, and thinking about his new life, moved from Ohio and, and getting, new, getting a new manager. There's just a lot of personal stuff in that song. And um, But uh, yeah, Casey's at bat, Time to Change the Batter was about his uh, previous management. <laughs> and the, the lyric couldn't get much higher. Is he referring to literally altitude? Of Colorado. Yes, he he wasn't really talking about the drug. A lot of people thought it was the drugs. I, I didn't. No. I, it, yeah. It, I, yeah. It was the altitude. We were like at five thousand feet. Couldn't right, breathe. Right. <laughs> so, so we couldn't get much higher. And, <laughs> and then we finished that record. We finished that record at Caribou Ranch, which is at eight thousand eight thousand feet, right. which is even less oxygen. So, you know, you you speak about your experiences at Caribou Ranch, which. I was always fascinated by that studio because people would go there and live there while they were recording. And, you know, you work there with Dan Fogelberg and, and certainly with Joe Walsh. And it seems like you had some really remarkable times there. Oh, we had great times. It was one of the best studios in the world. Everybody recorded there. John Lennon, Elton John, the Beach Boys, Chicago. Everybody was there. Dan Fogelberg. We, actually, one thing a lot of people don't know is the Joe Walsh and Barnstorm album we did at Caribou was the very first album ever made there. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was the first record that come out of Caribou. And uh, we we did that. We, we made a lot of people. Danny Fogelberg was there. We we played uh, on uh, on a Rick Derringer's All American Boy album, and uh, 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 just uh, there was so much work there. Remember, this was the seventies, 
And there was tons of bands, tons of record deals, tons of money floating around, tons of everything. And uh, that's the way it was then. And that was one of the premier studios to work at. It was a, it was a bit expensive, but it was so exotic and amazing. Because first of all, the studio itself technically mm-hmm. was as, as state-of-the-art as you could get right. at the time. And then it was in the middle of the mountains on thousands of acres of vacant, beautiful land. They had these cottages up there where the bands would stay. They had a mess hall where you'd eat. In other words, you didn't have to leave there for like weeks at a time. Right. So it was just fabulous. And um, uh, so many great records came out of there. Well, and one uh, of them was, speaking of Dan Fogelberg, you recorded the Netherlands album there in 1977, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah, we recorded a bunch there with Dan. Mm-hmm. And uh, what else? I mean, as late as we even recorded the song The Language of Love there in the late 80s, I thought. It was the late 80s or something like that. But um, yeah, we uh, sadly it closed uh, several years ago. Uh, they had a fire. But um, yeah, we, we made a lot of records there. Some incredible records there. Yeah, yeah, really good. Let me ask you a couple personal questions. What have you discovered about success from your work with so many high-profile artists? Well, I've discovered that that um, uh, they're all different, mm-hmm. and they're you know they're they have totally different personalities. Yet they have a similar personality, right? And they they uh, they're. Uh, just uh you know amazing people to know you know i mean you, you may not always get along uh but that's kind of general in in all of life but but in other words you may i don't mean get along i mean you may not always agree with things uh especially musically but you have to look at them like wait a minute this guy is really successful with what he does and what he writes and stuff so you you ought to just shut up and listen mm-hmm. to him and so that's what we do, you know, and we, we, we learn, listen and learn. And uh, what I noticed about them all is that they're, they're really, really uh, intricate and sophisticated in, 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 their, in their thinking and what generates ideas and songs and lyrics and stuff. Uh, you know, sometimes Dan Fogelberg would get on his horse and go riding in the mountains and come back with a whole set of mm-hmm. lyrics. It's like, you know, I mean, and, and, and Stephen Stills would, would, you know, get on a, a sailboat. A, 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 well, not only a sailboat, uh, but also like a cigarette. Oh, right. Boat, and just <laughs> go kick, kick ass out in the ocean and come back with a rock and yeah. roll song. You know, and then some guys like Neil Young would just, you know, he would sit in his barn up there, his studio barn, and just start playing. And, and, and the words would come. I don't know. They're all totally different. Yet they all are similar in that sense that they need whatever it takes to drive them into a song is is completely different in all of them. But then once in a while they they you know they they have they cross those lines and they you know they they do it the same way. You know sometimes Joe Walsh would sit sit with his guitar and come up with a great lick or great line. He come up with life in the fast lane like that you know and uh just all of a sudden he's going da 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 it's like holy shit what's that that's a killer line and and all of a sudden it becomes one of the eagles biggest song so i don't know um it, it, i i kind of like being a, a fly on the wall with all these guys because i i really learn a lot from what what makes them tick and what personally inspires you in art and also in life Oh, geez. Um, a, a lot of, is my relationship with my wife. You know, it, those, those type of songs, it's very easy to write about her. Um, other than that, there's, you know, I write songs about, you know, my life's experience being on the road and stuff and, and the people I meet. And um, there's just all kinds of things that, that, you know, we're bombarded every day with inputs into our brain, you know, and, and so... Once in a while, if something really hits you hard, you write about it, you know, because, you know, and, and everybody's like that. Not everybody's able to write ly- it down lyrically, but uh, a lot of people write in, in diaries and stuff and in 
in a sense of like poetry or what, or just stories or whatever. Well, musicians, writers, songwriters, they kind of take that and make songs out of them, you know, but a lot of people do that. They write in their diaries and journals and, um, and you know, those, those in musicians' lives become songs. And what's changed about your perspective in life as you've gotten older? Uh, well, <laughs> Uh, the world's gotten a little crazier, and uh, uh, and 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 I'm I'm kind of sometimes look searching for what they want to hear. You know, I don't know. Sometimes I don't know anymore what they want to hear. You know, all them great lyrics from old Beatles records and 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 the rock and roll. You know, the the uh, Bad Boy Stones lyrics, and you know, I don't know anymore uh, what uh, what the general population is looking for. I knew back then because, you know, all you got to do is, is listen to Beatles records and all that. And also, also all you got to do is talk to young people and there and you ask them, why are you so interested in these old records? And they go, oh, the lyrics, you know? So I don't know what it is about today's writers that, um, you know, country music is writing some really nice lyrics, but I don't know today. Uh, a lot of rock and roll lyrics are, are a little vague as far as I'm concerned. They're, I'm not sure what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. You know? And uh, and I'd like to know what they're talking about, but I, I, I don't always know what they're talking about. Whereas, you know, years ago, those lyrics were in your face. You knew what they were yeah. talking about. And, and I kind of miss that. I do too. You know, I kind of miss, you know, hearing a song, you know, and you know what it's about. And, and uh and then, you know, it's fine-tuned, of course, and so the lyric ends up being a beautiful piece of poetry, you know, and you, but you, it, with a beautiful story. And, you know, we used to live those lyrics, you know, and um, uh, we, could, we could listen to those records over and over again uh, to hear those words again, you know. Oh, absolutely. Hey, Joe, I, I want to get to my closing questions right now. And one of them is, since this show is called Making It, what does making it mean to you, both personally and professionally? Wow. Um, making it. Uh, definitely making it is not monetary. Uh, that is, you know, that's some people think that that's what's making it is. And, and th- you know, that's part of it, of course. But I think what making it is, 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 is uh, uh, getting over hurdles, getting over those hurdles that, that haunt your life, you know, if, whether no matter what line of work you're in, no matter what walk of life you're in, um, uh, making it is like, you know, uh, I, I imagine, you know, guys in music, that's a given. We know what that means. It means like your, your songs are a success or your band's doing well or, you know, all that sort of stuff. But there's also a million kinds of walks in life, you know, making it, it imagine making it uh, what that means to, to athletes, you know, I mean, uh, and, and, and actors and, and people in business or, you know, uh, p- people that are, that are, you know, electrical engineers making it what what do you think they think it is you know i mean it's it's crossing certain lines and getting over certain hurdles that you finally realize that that uh you're you you you're you have seen some success at what all your uh you know your efforts have you know brought and so um that's the way I look at making it. It's not just successful in monetary or, or fame. You know, it's, it's a lot more than that. And can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Uh, never give up, uh, never surrender. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, no, it, it's, it's, it's not hard. It's, it's, you know, it, it follow your dream and, that dream has all kinds of roads. There's never been a dream that was completed that had a straight road. It, it's all up and down hills and, you know, rugged territory, rugged, you know, and, and, and so just keep at it. And the pace is slow and fast. You know, some days you get way ahead and you're feeling good. And then you, then you have a month that this, you know, that you get dragged down. And I just, I don't know. I, I, I fell in love with this uh, years ago, and I, I, for 
happy and I'm so thankful that I still have that that spark and that spirit in me that I still am in love with. I'm not I don't take anything for granted. I still enjoy the hell out of it and have fun doing it. And uh, and I constantly look to learn something more about this tomorrow, you know, and um, uh, I certainly don't know anywhere near what I'd like to know. And um, so it's, it's a, it's a nice goal to maintain where uh, I kind of like thinking of when you're, when you're riding a horse and you, you have some oats on a stick ahead of him, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) and and he keeps wanting to get, you know, there's always that tries, you know, he wants to get, so he keeps running and keep moving, you know? And so, uh, I kind of like thinking of it that way that, uh, no matter where you've been or what you've done, there's always some new stuff that, you you know, you're going to get to and and get to do. And it's exciting, you know? So I don't know, don't obviously don't ever give up. And I know that that's such a cliche statement and all that, but there's a lot of truth to that giving up as soon as you even have that in your mind, you're finished. You know, you can't even think that way, you know? So, uh, your your game's over once you even start thinking Mm -hmm. that way, you know, just, uh, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's very difficult. And it appears that some people have had it way easy, but you don't know the whole truth of what got people certain places, you know? You know, you don't know how long they struggled and what obstacles they had to run into. And so, you know, you look at some, a lot of people are jealous of success and all that, but, you know, really and truly, you don't know what it took for them to get there. And I really appreciate their success. Yeah, you know, obviously there's always exceptions mm-hmm. to rule. One, one in a thousand people, you know, had it handed to them, but, you know, I, I certainly didn't. Uh, starting with a polka band, I didn't have it handed to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear you say that you never take it for granted. No, ever, never, never. Did you have a plan? And and also, did you um, have there been periods in your life where a tour ended and then there was nothing, and you started to doubt what might happen next or what might not? No, uh, I didn't have any doubts because usually something eventually will. But the only feeling I had, you know, several times in my life when the tour, a really big, good tour was ending. Right. And there was nothing booked ahead, you know, and, you know, really. So you go home and you're like, OK, the only thing I remember was this sucks. <laughs> <You> know, that, <laughs> It's like, wait a minute, I don't want to, I don't want to feel that, you know, that it's like, you know, you know, yeah, the big after tour party and all that, you know, and it's like, hey, great. And you go home and like, you sit there and go like, this sucks. You know, you want to, you want to keep going at, you know, so, but I never doubted that, you know, this business is so crazy and, and you, you know, that's why I said, don't give up because as soon as you start getting negative or feel like, uh, this it's all over with your phone <laughs> rings. Right. And, and it's like, uh, Hey, you want, you, what are you doing? You want to get together? And, and, and so that's what I kind of love about the business. It's, it's not, it's not guaranteed and it's not a given. And I can, that's exciting to me because, you know, obviously if the whole thing crash and burn, then I'll do something else, you know, but so far I haven't had to do that. And I'm not young, so <laughs> well. Well, so what? I, I'm still at it, and and, and not and ever intending on retiring ever. Uh, well, nor I. Yeah, there's no reason to. Yeah, no, no, no yeah. reason to. What What would you do if you did? If you weren't a drummer, would you be a builder? Probably, um, I would probably build and design electronic things. I was a math major. And uh, I love electronics. I studied a lot of electronics. And if I wasn't a musician, that's always exciting to me to design electrical things and all that. And I mean, that's a whole different world. I know that. But uh, I just uh, am, am so fascinating with that world. And, you know, there's a lot of school and education you have to go through to do that. And I'm nowhere near mm-hmm. that. But I'm just saying, if it weren't music, uh, I would love to to be in some kind of electronics, but it wouldn't be, uh, it would be like electronics as laboratory. So you're like inventing and creating stuff, you know? Absolutely. So, so Joe, my final question is at this point of your life with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self? Oh, I would probably, geez, I don't know. Uh, 
I would probably, um, I would probably say to pay attention more to uh, older, experienced people. A lot of times, young people they know it all, and so did we. And you know, I'm not, no, I'm not making fun or just criticizing. Mm-hmm. We all did it. And the one thing I learned is that, you know what, we don't, we didn't, uh, we still don't, but I, I don't think, but we didn't know everything back then. We, we were a far cry from knowing everything. And, but we seemed to think we knew it at all. And um, I, I don't think anybody would criticize me for saying that. But, uh, and, and what I look, as I look back, I was like, you know what, you should have listened to that guy. He was right. And all the mistakes you've ever made, there might have been somebody in your life that said, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And there was. And you didn't Mm -hmm. listen. And then you got (laughs) bit. So as I look as I look back, I think that's the one thing I would have corrected. And I I would hope that young people would would hear that, that, you know what, you don't have to do what they say. But you should listen to what people say at times, especially older people, people that have done this and experienced in, in any walk of life, not music, any walk of life. And and um, and so that's my only regret as far as what I would do differently. I, I would have listened to more people. And and I don't know how that would have changed my life. It's, it's impossible to say. But I do know one thing that a lot of things that I look back on, whether it was your dad or your friends or older friends or your uncle or somebody that said something to you way back then, and you thought they were idiots, that all of a sudden, you know what? They were right. And and that's that's kind of scary that, you know, and I hope that, you, you know, everybody's going to go through life and, and, and do, missing those opportunities. But the less you have to miss those, the better, I think. And you, you get to le- listen to experience. That doesn't mean that you have to do what they say. But I would advise at least listening, to, take it in, uh, you know, analyze it, whatever, and and then, you know, do your own thing. But um, that's the only thing I would suggest. Well, like your buddy Joe Wall says, life's been good to me so far. And, yes, and it has. <laughs> he's, he's had a good life. Well, and so so have you, Joe. I, I, I appreciate it every day I live and uh, every day I wake up and, and it's a new day and, and what kind of trouble can I get in, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and for a just final word, since um, the show's completely unedited, is there anything on your mind or on your heart that you would like to share with our listeners in closing? Well, I'll tell you what, um, in closing, uh, not a general statement. I'd really like to just pinpoint this, this, this situation we're in with this mm-hmm. virus. I'd really like to say, you know what, uh, stop with the politics and let's, let's get along and let's help each other. We, we're in this all. It's like my son's song said, we're all in this together. There's no, po- this is, this is scary stuff. And we, and, but you know what? We as a whole, as a people, are way more powerful than any virus. And so we we will get through this and we won't let it defeat us. But I'll tell you what, we, we got to just uh, stand tough and, 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 and get along and, and help each other. And, and call your neighbor. They may need something. <laughs> Amen to that. Yeah. Stay in and wash your hands and don't touch your face. I saw the doctor on TV the other day and he said, uh, chances are you won't get this virus if you, if you listen to the rules and wash your hands. Do not touch your face. And, uh, you know, and, and don't be close to anybody. And, and also, especially if they're coughing, it's like, then you'll mm-hmm. get it. It's hot. It's really, it's really, uh, dangerous. And, but, uh, if you listen to the rules and, and abide by them, you'll be okay. And like you said, we will all get through this together. Yes, sir. Man, it's been so great spending some time with you and sharing your stories and perspective. Uh, Joe Vitale, thank you so much. Thank you, Terry. It's been wonderful talking with you. Absolutely. And by the way, all of you listeners, stay safe. And Joe and I both really appreciate you sharing the hour plus with us. Oh, that's been great. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Wallman.